Welcome everybody to another episode of Southern Sorcery. Thank you for being here so much. Today we are looking at the most wanted outlaws of Thunder Junction Precon, helmed by Olivia, the opulent outlaw. She is a 3-3 vampire assassin and has flying and lifelink. Whenever one or more outlaws you control deal combat damage to a player, create a treasure token. Then you can pay three, sacrifice a treasure, and put two plus one plus one counters on each creature you control. Activate this at sorcery speed. So we already did a $50 budget upgrade video. We will link that right up here for you. If you have not watched that yet, you can go check that out. In addition to the ads we have already made, we are going to add some more without any budget restriction. We just want to try to optimize this deck as best as we can. That being said, there are several cards and several strategies existing within this deck already. You obviously want to be making treasures and putting plus one plus one counters on your creatures, which is what Olivia wants to do. So that is the strategy we're going to be leaning into the hardest. There are several several sub strategies within this. There's a quite a bit of lifelink. There's quite a bit of non-combat ping damage and there is some recursion as well. So in our cuts for our additions, some of those cards will be going away to make space for the main feature of this deck which is the treasures and the counters. So as we go along, you'll see that in the ads and removals, and I'll talk about each one of those as we go along as well. Before we get started, if you guys don't care, please drop a like and maybe comment. And if you enjoy this content, hit that subscribe button. It doesn't cost you anything and it helps us out tremendously. It is helping our channel to grow and thank you so much to everyone who has already done so. So with no further ado, let's get right on into it. First up, our additions, we are going to do an ad and then what we took out for it. First up is bovine intervention for one and a white. It's an instant and it says destroy target artifact or creature its controller makes a 2-2 ox and then what we took out feed the swarm which is a sorcery for one in a black and it says destroy target creature or enchantment an opponent controls you lose life equal to that permanent converted mana cost so very similar one takes care of an enchantment instead of an artifact however bovine intervention is an instant as opposed to a sorcery so a lot more flexibility there and limits it to what your opponents control there is not that restriction on bovine intervention again just allowing you for some more flexibility as well as we lose life equal to that permanence converted mana cost and in a life gain deck yeah that's useful however bovine intervention just has a much wider scope of playability without as many restrictions. Next up, we have Goldspan Dragon. It is three red red for a dragon, and it has flying in haste, and it says when it attacks or becomes the target of a spell, create a treasure token. And then it also gives us treasures you control have tap, sacrifice this artifact, add two mana of any one color. So now instead of our treasures tap sacking for one mana of any color, they'll tap for two mana of the same color. So it's any color, but it's two of the same color. And then what we took out was Discreet Retreat, which was an enchantment for a land. And the enchanted land had add two mana of any one color, spend this mana only to cast outlaw spells or activate abilities from outlaw sources. And then it says whenever you cast your first outlaw spell each turn, you draw a card and lose a life. So Goldspan Dragon gives us more repeatable value than Discrete Retreat because it's not limited to spending the treasures on Outlaws only. Discrete Retreat is a very good new card and then it also has card draw stapled onto it, but we also can make up for that in other places. Next add, we have Black Market Connections. This is a staple. It is a fantastic card and at the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, Choose one or more. Create a treasure token and lose one life. Draw a card and you lose two life. So there's that card draw that we replaced. And then the third one is create a 3-2 colorless shapeshifter. Creature token with changeling, you lose three life. So that 3-2 shapeshifter changeling will also be an outlaw as it is all creature types. So we are going to be making outlaws with this, making treasures with this, and then drawing some cards with this. So this is a great include here. And we are taking out life insurance, which was three white black, and it had extort, and you could pay into it, and each opponent lose one life. And then when a non-token creature dies, you lose one life and create a treasure token. So black market connections just gives you way more flexibility and variety. It also is a three mana cost card as opposed to life insurance, which is five. So we're slimming our curve down a little bit as well there, but overall, much better than life insurance. Next, we have Anointed Procession. It is three and a white, and it says, if an effect would create one or more tokens under your control, it creates twice that many of those tokens instead. So now, all of our treasures, when we make them, 
we're going to be making twice as many and then as well as any other creature tokens that we're making in this deck but mostly for those treasure tokens we're going to be able to make a lot more treasure tokens and to make space for that we are getting rid of we ride at dawn which is a enchantment and it is two and a white and it says legendary creature spells you cast have convoke Convoke is nice, but it's just restricted to legendary creatures. This isn't a Legends Matter deck. The second clause is whenever your commander attacks, create a 1-1 one, one mercenary. Creature token with tap, target creature you control gets plus 1 plus 0 oh until the end of turn. Activate that only as a sorcery. So it will make tokens, but overall not super on theme with this deck. Not anywhere close to what Anointed Procession is going to do for us as far as value goes. Then we also have Mondrak Glory Dominus for two white white. It is also a token doubler, the same as Anointed Procession, except for this time, it is on a 4-4 four, four Phyrexian Horror body. And then it has the ability to potentially endure a board wipe as you can pay one and two Phyrexian white mana. And that means you can pay life instead of the mana. So you would pay one and four life, or you would pay one, two life and a white. It just gives you the flexibility to pay to life. And you can put an indestructible counter on Mondrak. So he would be able to endure through a destroy all creatures board wipe. And then we are taking out for that Dead Before Sunrise. It's three and a red, so the same mana cost. This one says, until the end of turn, outlaw creatures you control get plus one plus end gain. Tap this creature deals damage equal to its power to target creature. Again, kind of more on the ping targets for damage, having your creatures fight other creatures. Not a bad card, just not really in line with what the commander really wants to do versus what Mondrak will do for us. Again, the value for Mondrak doubling our treasures is vastly more valuable than an instant where we have our creatures fight some other creatures. Potentially, though, if that card was to stay in the deck, it's it's a good card. It could be a one-sided board wipe, but that requires a lot of setup. Mondrak is just going to be a better option overall. Next, we've got Mirkwood Bats. It is three and a black for a flying 2-3 that says whenever you create or sacrifice a token, each player loses one life. So now every time we make a treasure, each opponent is going to lose one life. And every time we sacrifice a treasure, each opponent is going to lose one life. So as far as being able to ping our opponents goes, this is much more on theme as we're wanting to constantly make treasures and sacrifice those treasures. And then we are replacing the Mist Meadow Skulk, which was a two drop for a one one with lifelink and it has protection from converted mana cost three or greater. Just kind of an outlier in this deck, not, not really on theme with anything other than that there is a sub theme of lifelink in this deck, but our commander also has lifelink. Miss Meadow Skulk is just a 1-1, one, one, so it doesn't gain us a whole lot of life. It just kind of doesn't make sense, whereas the Mirkwood Bats are going to just do a ton of damage to our opponents, giving us a much more on theme creature. Next, we've got Phyrexian Arena. It is three, and at the beginning of your upkeep, you draw a card and lose a life. That's a staple I'm sure you guys have seen many, many times. Um, we're just trying to get a little bit more card draw on board and because we do have that sub theme of lifelink we should be able to regenerate some life so paying one life to draw a card is no big fee and then we are going to take out bandits hall it is a new artifact it is on theme with this set as in it fits great with the outlaws thunder junction it makes sense but in this deck it says when you commit a crime put a loot counter on bandits hall and a crime is targeting any of your opponents in any of the permanents they control or their graveyards this ability triggers only one each turn then you can tap it for a mana of any color so it is a mana rock and then you can pay two and tap it to remove two loot counters from bandits hall to draw a card that's a ton of hoops to jump through to draw a card that's why we felt like phyrexian arena would be better and for three it will provide mana but we should be making enough treasures that that's not really super beneficial in this deck it's just a little out of place in our opinion. Next add, we have Revel in Riches. It is five and a black for an enchantment that says when a creature an opponent controls dies, create a treasure token. And then at the beginning of your upkeep, if you have 10 or more treasures, you win the game. So here's a win con for us. In addition to it generates more treasures for us. So a fantastic card in this deck that resolves on like turn five, potentially you have 10 treasures out. And then the removal for this one was another three mana artifact that is new for this deck. It's also a mana rock and then you can pay one and tap it and put a bounty counter on a target creature. Activate this only as a sorcery. Whenever a creature with a bounty counter on it dies, each of its controller's opponents draws a card and gains two life. So a weird three drop that taps for mana, 
and you can pay one into it. And then when the creature dies with bounty counter on it, each of your opponents draws a card and gains two life. So weird like group hug, very odd card. Again, just not efficient in what it does. So that's why it's on the chopping block. And then next we are going to add a Chroma's Will. This is going to be a win con for us in this deck. I know you guys have seen and played it before. If you control your commander, you can choose both. Otherwise, you just choose one. And then the two options are creatures you control gain flying vigilance double strike and then the second one is creatures you control gain lifelink indestructible and protection from all colors and so you can either use this as protection from a board wipe or you can use it as a finisher fantastic card and then we are taking out for this trailblazers boots which is two for an equipment artifact and it gives equipped creature non-basic land walk and then it has an equipped cost of two so that one costs four and so does a chroma's will by the time you equip it trailblazers boots again th they've gone heavy on the boots for this set as it is cowboys and outlaws and everybody's wearing boots so they've got a lot of boots in this set that being said there's just a lot better options out there and a chroma's will is one of them then we've got ragavan nimble pilferer this is a an auto include in here as well when ragavan deals combat damage to a player create a treasure token then exile the top card of that player's library until the end of turn, you may cast that card. Again, we don't care as much about the playing the card, although that is a fantastic ability, but it's a one drop or a two one that makes treasures and fits into our outlaw theme as he is a pirate. Um, so this is another great addition here. And we have taken out Witch of the Moors, which was three black black for a total of five for a human warlock with death touch. At the beginning of your end step, if you gained life this turn, each opponent sacrifices a creature and you return up to one creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So that does provide us a little bit of recursion. And there is a small sub theme of recursion here in this deck, but at five mana to do something that's really not what this deck wants to do seems extremely expensive when we can have an option like Ragaman. Next, we have an enchantment called All Will Be One. It's three red red, and it says whenever you put one or more counters on a permanent or player, All Will Be One deals that much damage to target opponent, creature and opponent controls, or planeswalker and opponent controls. So now every time we pay for Olivia to put the two plus one plus one counters onto each creature we control, we have that much damage to shoot wherever we want it, somebody's face, at somebody's creatures, at somebody's plane walkers. However we want to spend that damage we have. This is a really good card in this deck. And to make space for that, we are taking out the Dire Fleet Ravager, which is three black black, so the same cost. It has Menace and Death Touch. When it enters a battlefield, each player loses a third of his or her life rounded up. That's a huge, huge hit of life. And yes, life is a resource, but it's each player. So that includes us as well. We are in a deck that has some life gain. However, it's not extremely heavy on life gain. This just seems like all will be one. We can do whatever we want to with the damage. Dire Fleet Ravager is going to take a third of our life no matter what. So even if we've gained 10 or 15 life in the early goings, when we cast this, we're still going to lose a third of our life total no matter what that total is. So that's a huge hit potentially for everybody. But why not have it just be one sided with all will be one? Every time we put counters on stuff, we can send that damage wherever we choose. Much more flexibility and much more one-sided. Next, we have Kellogg, Dangerous Mind. This is a newer card. It has first strike and haste. Whenever it attacks, create a treasure token, sacrifice five treasures, gain control of target creature for as long as you control Kellogg. Activate this only as a sorcery. So another creature that is a mercenary, so fits right into our outlaw theme. So he'll generate a treasure token when he attacks, and then with Olivia out, he'll also generate if he does combat damage so with this we'll be making more treasures and to make space for him we have taken out grinzo havoc razor and grinzo says whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player choose one go target creature that player controls don't care about that exile the top card of that player's library until the end of turn you may cast that card and spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast that spell being able to play other people's spells is great. However, the only synergy this provides with our deck is the fact that it is a rogue, and we can replace that with something that does much, much more for us. Next up, we have Moonshaker Calvary for five white, white, white. This is the white version of Crater Hoof Behemoth, so this is a game ender for us. Has flying. When Moonshaker Calvary enters the battlefield, creatures you control gain flying and get plus X plus X until the end of turn, where X is the number of creatures you control. So it's going to grant your whole team flying and you're going to be able to get through potentially with a whole bunch of damage here this way. The only thing is it is not an outlaw. That being said, it is much better than what was in the deck, which was Mirror Entity, which can be a great card. It would be an outlaw, but you pay X into it until the end of turn. Creatures you control 
have base power and toughness and gain all creature types. So then all of your creatures would be outlaws. That being said, you have to pay a lot into it for this to make sense. It does not give them evasion of any kind. So all of those creatures potentially can just be chump block, whereas the Moonshaker Cavalry grants flying. Next, we're going to add Jessica's Will for two and a red. Another spell that says if you control your commander, you can cast both. And it is add one red mana for each card in a target opponent's hand and then also exile the top three cards of your library, you can play them this turn. So it gives us a huge bump in ramp and gives us the card advantage to see the next three cards on top of our deck and be able to play them this turn, just a staple. And what we've removed is the Orzov Signet, pay one, tap it to add white and a black. We chose the Orzov Signet because we have more red in this deck. Truthfully, if you guys wanted to cut the signets altogether that are in here, couldn't blame you because you're making tons of treasures. So we don't really need a lot of mana rocks in this deck as we are able to make those. Next up, we have Ink Shield for three white black, an instant that prevents all combat damage that would be dealt to you this turn. For each one damage prevented this way, create a 2-1 white and black Inkling creature token with flying. So this is another potential game finisher. As anyone who has seen this played, knows how extremely powerful it is and with this one we were replacing mass mutiny which is the same mana cost three red red for a total of five the same cmc and it says for each opponent gain control of up to one target creature that player controls until the end of turn untap those creatures they gain haste until the end of turn so mass mutiny steals one creature from each of your opponents and then lets you have it until the end of turn which is great that's a it's that's that's nice to be able to do that kind of thing but Ink Shield just feels much more powerful than Mass Mutiny in this deck. So that rounds out our instant sorceries, enchantments, and creatures. Next, we have our lands. So first up for lands, we have the Savai Triome, which does enter tapped, but it also has the option for cycling, and it taps for all three colors, which is great, as opposed to having a something like Canyon Slow, which we'll take out for entering the battlefield tap, which also has cycling, but it only taps for two of our three colors. Next addition we have is Luxury Suite, which offers us the ability for it to enter untapped if you have two or more opponents, adds red or black, and we are going to get rid of the Temple of Malice, which enters the battlefield tapped, and then you would scry one, which also adds black or red. Then we have Sundown Pass, taps for black or white, enters the battlefield tapped unless you control two or more other lands, and we are going to take out the Temple of Triumph, which enters tap, and it also scries one on ETB. Then we're going to add Haunted Ridge as red or black, and it enters tapped unless you control two or more other lands, and removing, we will be removing Temple of the False God. It taps for two colorless, but you can only activate this ability if you control five or more lands. It's just a risk I'm not willing to take in a deck that makes a ton of treasure. Then we also have Shattered Sanctum. It will enter the battlefield tapped unless we control two or more other lands. Taps for black or white. And then we are going to remove Temple of Triumph, which is red or white, but it enters the battlefield tapped and scries one. Then lastly, we are adding the Vault of Champions and it enters tapped unless you have two or more opponents. And we're going to let go of the Path of Ancestry, which enters the battlefield tap. It taps for one mana of any color in your commander's color identity. And then when you spend mana to cast a creature spell that shares a creature type with your commander, you can scry one, which is good. But our commander is a vampire assassin. This isn't really a typal deck. It does care about outlaws, but outlaws is a collection of creature types. And so Path of Ancestry will not recognize outlaws as a creature type. If that was the case, Path of Ancestry would definitely be staying in this deck. It would justify it coming in tap. So again, what we've done is move on from some of the things that don't quite make much sense in this deck. They're servicing a third and fourth strategy that kind of doesn't really have so much of a place when you build a deck and you build into what your commander does you really want to try to lean very heavily into the thing that your commander does well and then put other creatures in place that supplement that that way if your commander gets removed you have other ways to keep moving forward with your game plans thanks again so much for watching please like and subscribe comment this video if you have other suggestions for cards we missed you can only put 100 cards in a deck and so we know there's tons of cards out there that have a place in this deck. Check out our social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Discord, Patreon, and we just started doing Twitch streaming. So check that out. 10 p.m. on Wednesday nights, we are streaming live gameplay here on YouTube and on Twitch. So check us out there on your preferred social network platform. 
Thanks again so much and have an awesome day. Bye-bye.